A little bit of background about NetKey is we've been around for four years providing compliance tools around KYC, AML, accredited investor checks to token sales, exchanges, OTC desks, banks, and other enterprise customers. And so we have a lot of experience in all of the nuance and ever-changing regulatory environment. Um, Justin and Don, our co-founders, have a, a long and storied history in the startup space, particularly around scaling the internet and founded NetKey specifically to tackle the you know, compliance issues that we all face in this room today. And so a quick sort of disclaimer on this talk is we're gonna talk quite a bit about some of the background history, some of the enforcement actions that have taken place in this space, and what some of the uh, best practices are today around KYC, AML, you know, raising money from investors, and, and how to onboard them appropriately and responsibly. I am definitively not an attorney, I am not uh, a lawyer, and so you do, as a best practice, want to make sure that you employ a experienced lawyer in the space. Yes, there is a lot of gray area, yes, there is a lot of unknown, um, but you should never build your KYC and AML policy based on a presentation you see at any show. Um, one of Justin's famous jokes in this industry is that there are a lot of terms that looked at by different people mean different things. And a, a non-crypto example of that is this word, which to a chemist would read as unionized and to a plumber would read as unionized, two very different interpretations of the same word. And so in our space, we have a similar example with the Dow, right? And so if you have any sort of banking or financial background, the Dow means one word to you. And if you're a crypto person through and through, then the Dow has a different meaning. And so the same is true for compliance as well. There's a lot of terms in the KYC and AML space that are used interchangeably that don't always necessarily mean the same thing. So it's really important to get underneath the surface and understand a lot of the different variables at play here. Uh, what we're showing here on this screen is the irresistible force versus immovable object of our industry and fundraising in it and the continued adoption of blockchain and blockchain companies, coupled with the never-ending descent of compliance, right? And so this example here on the graph shows when the SEC first came in and declared a digital asset, a cryptocurrency, a security, uh, we had a little sideways movement here before continuing up and to the right where we all want to go. So the takeaway from this is compliance is going to be important. It's going to come, but we can still continue to innovate and develop this space. So a couple of examples here throughout history, uh, the last several years, and, and we'll do a key takeaway from each one. Uh, the first example here is FinCEN, which uh, issued a cease and uh, fine and, and consent decree to, to Ripple, uh, centered around the travel and AML rule. And so some of the, the takeaway from this was the quote at the bottom, which talks about how innovation is great, but we need to protect companies and the space and, and investors from tech smart criminals that could take advantage of new technologies before everyone fully understands you know, what's going on. Bitfinex also has some regulatory history. And so this was the CFTC, so different US regulator here. And this was actually the way that the Bitcoin was being stored. So it's not actually a KYC or AML issue here, but uh, the takeaway from this was the quick changes they had to make as a result led them to make some very rapid deployments of, of new policies. And some people believe that this was directly related to the resulting $70 million hack that happened shortly thereafter. Uh, SEC, as we said, got involved with the Dow. This was around selling unregistered securities. And again, the quote is sort of the important thing here. It's about innovation is great, but we need to protect the markets. We need to protect investors. BTCE, this, the takeaway from this is where you're based, where you operate, doesn't always protect you from other regulators outside of where you may call uh, the company's home or where you're operating. And so this was an example of an exchange that operated in Europe and in Asia. They had a few US customers, and some other non-US customers had various AML red flags and issues there. And a US regulator got involved declaring that because there was US investors, even though those weren't the ones at fault with the AML issues, they had still had jurisdiction. So they actually arrested this operator uh, as he got off a plane in Greece. So despite operating in Europe, despite being physically in Europe, 
US regulator still stepped in. And then last quick one that we'll do here is Munchie, which was a little more recent, you know, less than a year ago. This was another SEC selling unregistered securities example where they had ran a token sale. It was claimed to be a utility token, yet explicitly in all of the marketing, they talked about the types of investment gains that investors would realize in the long term. So where does that leave us? Well, there are a lot of regulators that are watching us, whether that's US, internationally, there are tons of alphabet soup enforcement agencies that are looking at us in this industry, what we're doing, how we're raising money, how we're interacting with investors across the board in all sorts of activities. And so the microscope is continuing to zoom in on all of us in this room. And so we really need to take care and understand you know, how we're doing these things and how we're going to raise money appropriately. You have to think about where they're going with the regulation, right? There are a lot of places, uh, particularly in Asia, where the changes are very rapidly approaching. In the fall, there's going to be quite a bit of change there with the way that exchanges can onboard customers. And so you have to develop a compliance policy in advance. Last minute switches expose you to things like the, the Bitfinex hack. There's a little bit more that goes on as well besides just regulatory considerations. Uh, in Singapore, for example, the MAS is open season there, inviting people to come and run token sales, yet you raise all that money, go to a bank, that communication hasn't quite sunk up, so you have difficulty opening a bank account there. So you, again, need to consider where you're doing things, how you're raising money, and how we're operating. So what are some of the best practices with KYC and AML today? Well, when it comes to individuals, you need to make sure that it's a real person. How do you do that? Well, you can inspect an ID document, you can do various credit checks, um, various sources out there can do that, lots of players in the KYC and AML space. But how is the ID determined to be real? Well, you have to use technology, you have to use an automated solution that really inspects an ID document at a forensic level. You have to match that document to the, ID, to the person that's presenting it, right? What's stopping me from using anyone's ID here in the room if they're not going to tie me to that document in some way. Um, sanctions and watch list checks, so AML still very much applies. Cross-referencing lists like OFAC, politically exposed persons. You can also run negative news checks, so that's sort of the cousin of AML screens. It's not a international or financial crime list, but you can actually cross-reference names of investors against police blotters, against news articles and publications to see if they've been associated with any sort of business, financial, or other crime that may give you, you know, pause and, and expose you to some sort of uh, exposure down the road. Corporations, you can, there are many people, token sales, exchanges that onboard corporate accounts. And so, yeah, you have to perform KYC and AML at the corporate level as well. Uh, the signatory, the person acting on behalf of that account, goes through the same sort of individual KYC and AML process. And then you also will run KYC and AML on uni for, uh, UBOs of that organization as well. Accredited investors. A lot of people think that this is a US only uh, consideration. And while that is true for the vast majority of cases, accredited investors, sophisticated investors, some of the other uh, language to describe similar types of qualified investors that theoretically uh, can take advantage of more risky investments, uh, there's different rules and requirements for how you verify that they actually meet that status. So KYC today, we talked a little bit about this already, uh, is the ID real? Um, using machine learning and computer vision automated techniques, you can actually inspect a document at a pixel by pixel level, not only to check security features like microprint and, and barcode sequencing and structure, but you can also do a tamper evidence analysis. So a lot of providers like to talk about how they catch fake IDs. That's really not the most common fraud vector that you'll see in this space when you're onboarding you know, new investors. Typically, it's a tampered ID, a photo of a photo of an ID, a manipulated ID, either digitally or physically. So you want to make sure, you know, if you're pulling a third-party solution, you want to know how that they're being able to thwart these types of attacks that you may be exposed to. Is the ID expired? It's sort of odd that you can have a valid ID one day, and the very next day, just because of the date, your ID is now considered no longer valid, but that is the way that the law reads in many jurisdictions. Um, Moving on here, there's quite a few other 
ways to match the identity to the person presenting it. And there's various biometric procedures out there, whether it's facial recognition, fingerprinting, liveness detection. Now, you can tie it to the phone. There, there are a lot of interesting things out there that can actually tie to service providers and match it up based on the location of the ID and where the person's coming from. With AML, one of the key considerations is to make sure it's tunable. Uh, one of the issues circling around AML is you get a high degree of false positives. A lot, a lot of times in the industry, you'll see somewhere around 15 to 20 percent of false positives, and that's a lot of additional review work to do on those edge cases. And so how do you eliminate that? How do you make a, a better experience, a better onboarding experience, both for the end investor who would be put in a hold status if they have an AML hit, and for your own internal team that has to make a decision on these things? Well, you can do things like running the AML in native character sets as opposed to translating it and then trying to run the AML uh, in a uniform way. So all these things can be tunable, again, with also fuzziness level, how close to the iteration of the name you want to look for hits. So what does NetKey do? Uh, we read and collect the identity document. We support documents from 197 countries, 3,400 documents overall. Now, of course, not all documents are created equal. Some of them have particular challenges around how long they're in circulation for. Certain countries issue government IDs that are good for life, and so as you can imagine, sometimes those things can be pretty mangled and damaged, and those are a little more difficult to deal with. Um, you have to run, we run biometric analysis with a facial recognition and liveness testing to tie the user to that document. We run negative news screens and international bank rate AML. And all of this happens in about 45 to 60 seconds for the end investor. So we really created a situation to put them in a position for success with some camera techniques and real-time coaching. And on the back end, we have results about 45, or 15 to 45 seconds later, you'll have the results of your onboard uh, investors' AML hits, if any, the results of the ID verification, as well as any other documents that were collected, whether for accredited investor verification or corporate onboards. Uh, some things to watch out for when you're evaluating a KYC or AML provider is the ID. Is it being validated? Is it being you know, presented you know, with the owner? How are they doing that? There are manual review operations out there where they have call centers that are physically looking at the IDs and determining, yeah, you know, that looks like a good ID to me. For me, I always have concerns about how is that data being transmitted? Where are those call centers located? And when we talk about things like microprint and hidden security features that are not visible with the human eye, how can you really determine that with that type of solution? So automated machine learning technology solutions help you get a much more forensic level of authentication with an ID document. It enables you to scale and handle very many concurrent transactions at the same time in the case of an exchange or a very anticipated token sale. And you also want to control for customer experience. Again, put them in a position to succeed on their first try, which we do for well over 90% of our, of our end investors. So I have 30 seconds left. I'm going to give that back to you. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And thanks, as always, to, to, to Mo and everyone here for putting on another great event.